Hello and welcome to the Quivia Cast, the impromptu, occasional, infrequent podcast by us, the Quivia people. My name's Harley. You already know my voice because I yell about movie facts and trivia and quivia and such every week. But with me today is my sister, the author of the journals, I mean Quivia, Emily. Emily, how are you? Yeah, not bad. Turns out that we have uh, opinions about a movie that we recently saw. How dare us. So... We were talking about The Marvels, the movie that we saw recently, so we could do a quivia on the movie The Marvels, and we were like, hey, we've got thoughts about this. We even had some pretty decent thoughts that we were like, well, if only we had a a way to display these thoughts, share these thoughts. If only someone had podcasting equipment almost perfectly already set up, and if we had like a channel to put it on, per chance. Chekhov's podcasting equipment. (laughs) Ah, What has my life become? So, we had wildly differing opinions on the Marvels, didn't we? We went and saw it at the nice $15 theatre, and I'm not going to dox ourselves by saying which suburb we saw it in, but it was a suburb of Melbourne. There's only mm, four million of them, so you know. We live in Melbourne? Do we? It's canon now! I thought we were just watching uh, cave paintings on the wall. Yeah, well, there we go. Um, So we each have our own unique rating system because we are like that. So my first question after every single film is, Harley, what's your rating? I gave the Marvels a 2 out of 5. Emily, what's your rating? I gave it an 8 out of 10. That's fair. Thanks for... No, we're not doing that on the first episode. Um... So it's a good movie. Uh, let's start with the positives, since I know what we're probably going to talk about for the rest of the podcast. Um, the cast is stacked front to back. Aman Valani is a national treasure. I will die on that hill. Whatever they're paying her, they need to add like half a dozen zeros to the end. Because if there's a path forward for Marvel, and I think there is, I don't think it's as doom and gloom as a lot of people are saying, but Aman Valani is the person you put the mantle on for uh, helping the MCU go to the next level. Well, I think whatever we thought about the movie, we probably had similar feelings about the mid credits scene starring her um, because I was hyped. I, I was hyped. <laughs> Haley Steinfeld. In another absolute banger of a scene, looking at you across the Spider-Verse. <laughs> also true. I assume that Iman Vellani wrote that scene herself given that it's a... Uh, not so subtle lift of the Iron Man Avengers scene from Yonks ago. How do we know that that was actually Miss Marvel in that scene and just not Aman Valani herself <laughs> breaking the fourth wall? She was like, I want Young Avengers, so I'm going to do this. The only reason I assume she didn't just shoot the scene herself just in her spare time was because it was at cinema quality uh, footage. Well, you know, iPhones are getting pretty good nowadays. So I've heard. Yeah. What were highlights for you? What do you reckon? Uh, firstly, obviously the cast, watching them interact and the montage about a third of the way in where they start to practice their power switching. That was fun. That was really fun. Um, there's a lot of fun stuff that I wish they lent more into, like a lot of the stuff around Aladna was fun, but I just wish they'd lent more into it. Like, uh, Captain Marvel being like... Okay, we need to help them out also. Don't worry about it, but I'm married to their prince. What? And they only communicate in song. What? Don't worry about it. It's going to be fine. Carol, you could have mentioned both these things before we were physically here. Look, I know we had a somewhere between a three-minute and a three-day flight here, but don't worry about it. Ah, but jump points exist, so maybe three minutes. Yeah, and we travelled the fastest way possible by map, Woo. off screen. Those were some of my highlights. Um, there's a lot of fun stuff. Fury here is a little bit more of his comical fun Fury. Yes, the Captain Marvel Fury is back. (laughs) He's playing uh, Nth Banana here, so he doesn't get to be all grumpy and brooding, which is fine. I like both flavours of Fury. Look, after Secret Invasion, which wasn't my favourite Marvel property by far, I'm happy to have Fun Fury back. Um, It's something closer to what I'd like to see out of him. I'm happy to see Cogently Written Fury back. Woo! This movie kind of almost makes Secret Invasion non-canon. Um, well, it was supposed to... Secret Invasion was supposed to air after the Marvels, which makes a few things work a little bit better because obviously I think a question we both had was that, you know, so Valkyrie's just taken a bunch of... Cra- sorry, not Cray. Um, Scrolls. <laughs> but- bunch of scrolls to Earth and obviously where we left off with Secret Invasion was 
scrolls are no longer welcome in Earth. And so we were like, well, maybe they're going to get into a fight with new Asgard. But knowing that Secret Invasion was supposed to air after this um, and this was delayed makes that make a little bit more sense. I wonder why they just didn't delay Secret Invasion to keep the order because that could have used more time to cook. That's very generous. Um, That does make that make a little bit more sense. But then by the same token, in (laughs) this movie, we see that the Skrulls have established a colony on a planet when half a secret evasion was, oh, Fury, you just didn't keep your promise, mate. Well, and that, that's the whole thing, is that that planet doesn't exist by the time Secret Invasion happens if it releases after the Marvels. That's true, and it's a bit of an asterisk because if it released after, then thing, if things were different, they'd be different because then Ben Mundo would be like, oh, look, mate, you did find us one planet, but then uh, the Kree's creed it, so, you know. He would have gone up to Emperor Droge and been like, you haven't been talking to the Kree, have you? <laughs> And that is a failing of, I think, the people in charge of Marvel is that Secret Invasion should have happened after this and should have been better. But we could have had Mendo in this movie again and gotten one more scene with um, Captain Marvel and Ben Mendo. Yeah, look, it's not just because he's Australian. He's just true scenery. Dead set legend. Yep. Um, I really enjoyed having uh, Kamala's family around. Um, oh, yeah, for sure. I make no secret of the fact that I really enjoyed the Miss Marvel series. Um, is it as, you know, plot motivating for the entire thing as some other things? No. Is it incredibly fun? Yes. I haven't watched the entire series myself, but the bits of it I've seen uh, when you're watching it in the living room the lounge room, uh, they all looked quite fun and there's some good stuff in there for, so, for sure. Look, just close your eyes for about 10 seconds while some really bad CGI with skeletons happen and it's fine. It's honestly fine. There is no <laughs> war in the Marvel visual effects department. There's no war for unionisation with Marvel VFX at all. Yikes. People gave so much crud to CW TV special effects like five, ten years ago. And here we are with Marvel, where some of the stuff isn't any better. Yeah, and like the budget is like 10 times what anything the CW has ever had. And the CW made like 25,000 episodes of Flash and Arrow every year, plus the 13 other ones. So much content to keep up with. Remember when we used to watch every episode every week? Yeah, in order. Exhausting. Wow. So suffice it to say, opinions have been mixed about this movie, and... The two out of five for me encompasses more sort of structural issues. Like the thing that sticks out to me the most was when they were evacuating uh, Skrull colony planet. Tarnax. Tarnax, thank you. Um, There was some weird stuff around there. There was some weird cuts, weird jumps. And then in the middle of it all, you just sort of cut back to Carol being like, we can't save everyone, Kamala. Time for you to learn that lesson and for us to get to the next plot point. Like... That is obviously a really good thing to address with Miss Marvel. Um, Hers was much more like a Spider-Man type narrative for her TV show. It was much more local. There were still stakes, um, but obviously it was nowhere near that magnitude. And so that's a very interesting thing that you need to follow through with her. She's never seen things like this. Lives have never been on the line like this. But I think there were a lot of things that I would have liked another minute or two on that really would have helped. Yes, and there are some rumours permeating out from Marvel HQ that the movie was chopped down a bit in post. Mm. Some places I think you can really feel that. Um, it surprises me that the Aladdin sequence wasn't like a whole 20, 25 minute thing. Yeah, a bit more going on there. Would you have minded if the movie was another 15 minutes longer? No, and here's the thing. I am in mixed minds about the move to longer movies. Um, notably, and I think you might feel the same way, I like uh, Return of the Jedi, the only good sequel Star Wars movie. And that having its whole three-act structure, and then right when you feel like the movie would end, we go into overtime and get another 20 minutes on Crate and some other stuff. Believe me, Return of the Jedi has flaws, but the good stuff outweighs the flaws so hard that the other two movies don't exist in comparison. That's a different podcast. Return of the Jedi and Crate? 
uh, what was the Ryan Johnson sequel Star Wars movie? She... The Last Jedi. Yeah, I was going to say, you're talking prequels <sighs> with that one. All right, my bad. Nouns are tricky. Uh, all of that was in reference to The Last Jedi. No, nope, Re- understandable. Return of the Jedi is a perfectly cromulent movie. The Last Jedi needs a podcast in of itself um, because I think we both exist in the subset of five out of five movie. That's going to make people angry. Five out of five movie. <laughs> however, there is a lot wrong with it. Yes. Those two things can coexist. All of the side quest stuff on the gambling planet is a bit muddy. Um, but, hey, a lot of characters have characters and motivations and points of view and clashes that aren't merely physical. Shock horror. And new things in Star Wars are just not repeating the same old Skywalker stuff ad nauseum forever. We're, we're Forever. looking at you, number seven. For, uh, but, so if we bring it back to the Marvel... Oh, yeah, the so point of the podcast. the main question that I had to you, because you're much more cinema orientated, like, I, you have to be pretty bad to get a score five or below from me. I will generally have a fun time. Is it exponential up to ten? Yes. However, so my question to you was, how do you make Dar Ben a more compelling villain? That seems to be a very common complaint from people even who aren't review bombing or like having an opinion on this film without having seen it. Yeah, or just doing any of the generally shitty misogynistic things people want to do with the women folk in the movies. Wow, if those kids could read right now, they'd be really mad. Uh, If you're someone who hates the Marvels and hasn't seen it, uh, one of three things needs to happen. You owe 20% of every dollar you ever make complaining about the MCU to Brie Larson. Um, you need to fix your heart or die. Or I need to think of a third thing because the comedy rule of threes dictates that this should have been a three element list and I just, I'm sorry, I've screwed this up. They have to watch <sighs> Handmaid's Tale. <laughs> I, that's the, I'm not good or at improv. Or Handmaid's Tale Junior, Hunger Games. Oh, yeah, which is another property that we have seen a lot of, um, which mostly uh, – so I started playing that movie to do it for Kruvia while um, Harley was around and also our dad was around. Um, and <laughs> He just put it on in the lounge room. Yeah, and I was, it was getting late, so I was like, oh, let's let's pause it. And he was like, no, 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 let, let's, let's let it finish. And I was like, okay, dad's in for this ride. Let's let it cook. Let Collins cook. <laughs> Let's cook. Um, it did uh, require me shouting multiple times, this was a kid's book. It was sold by Scholastic. <laughs> I didn't know it was sold by Scholastic. Yeah, Scholastic. Anyway, so Dar Ben is a more compelling villain. Oh, yeah, the question, the raison d'etre for being here and why we set up podcast mics after yes. thinking of this 40 minutes ago. So uh, my mind went to the first thing it always does when how do we make – a more compelling villain, uh, which is The Rock, the Michael Bay movie starring Nicolas Cage, Sean Connery, Ed Harris, and several other people. Naturally. Why wouldn't it, really? Because as much as I don't want every movie to follow the same template ever, The Rock sets out a very, very useful default starting point for having a compelling villain. Uh, I'm not going to spoil the whole... and ships and... Sorry. Dun, 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 dun. That's another podcast. I'm not going to spoil the entire movie, but to give you a brief overview of the starting of it... Uh, We get a montage as Ed Harris, who plays the bad guy whose name I don't remember and I don't care to look up because I can't be bothered, honestly. Um, We get a montage of him visiting his wife's grave as a bunch of military uh, visuals flash over the screen and we hear radio transmissions of his last mission where the US government basically left a bunch of Ed Harris's soldiers to die behind enemy lines because they CBF'd going to pick them up. The second opening is Ed Harris and a bunch of his buddies storming an American military base in order to steal VX nerve gas rockets. Um, and as everyone in the room here has a, at least a bachelor's in chemistry, we all know how scary VX is. It's a bare minimum requirement to join the Quivia team is a bachelor's degree in chemistry. That's why it's a two-person team at this stage. Yep. Um, just a note, Ed Harris plays General Francis X. Hummel. Um, he, oh, however, Hummel, is yeah. noted elsewhere as a brigadier general. I don't know enough about the US military to know which one of those is the more accurate one. 37 people in the southern United States are getting a chart out as we speak. I'd believe it. So, the reason I go to The Rock is in a default movie template, you want the bad guy to start proceedings because the bad guy 
doesn't like something that's going on, wants something, and therefore is going to do something about it. And having movies in motion makes good movies. And so, well, so in a way she does start the proceedings, but not in a particularly compelling way. So she's obviously uh, getting the other bangle or quantum band as we now know them um, and then carries on her way. But we don't really have a starting point for that. And in fact, we don't really find out the chain of events until quite a way into the movie. So you're saying bring a lot of that forward? Yes. I would even cut the getting the quantum band scene out of the movie um, because it just sort of comes out of nowhere. Because it starts the movie, doesn't it? Yeah, I believe it does because we go from that to focusing on oh, Kamala, Kamala not doing her homework. Yeah, and then it's it. Then we go to her switching from there, yeah. or Carol, Monica, shenanigans. It's yeah, it's Darben that kicks things off. Yes, and uh, spoilers for this entire movie if that wasn't already obvious. Oh, we need to put that at the start of this. So much later in the movie, they actually have a little chatty chat with Darben. And we find out that she was part of Star Force, who is some protectorate group on uh, Halva, the Kree homeworld. It and is what uh, Captain Marvel herself was part of when she was on Hala and brainwashed, going under the name Verse. That is correct, I believe, because I watched that movie between six months and six years ago, and I can't remember how long. Yep, that's fair. So, uh, and then we see Darben's no good, very bad, horrible day as Captain Marvel just cruises in and crushes the supreme intelligence in a montage. Oh, yeah. Um, really easy. Doesn't take it five seconds. Just guess we're going to go get in and out burgers after this. <laughs> Guys, I'm sorry. I'll, I'll meet I'll meet up with you later. Just got to go destroy the supreme intelligence of the Kree real quick. I'm sorry. It's been on my to-do list. My bad. I'll see you in five. So I would start the movie with that day... I wouldn't start it with Captain Marvel finishing off, uh, was it Jude Law? Uh, whoever the yeah, antagonist Jude Law. of uh, Captain Marvel Oon was. I would start with Darben going into work, having a normal day. Maybe we see some of the problems facing her and her family, whatever. Um, give her a wife that we can cut out of the Chinese release. You know, all the standard Disney stuff. And then she goes to work as part of Star Force, clocks in. We want to have a sort of, I feel, very blue-collar aspect to this yeah because it should be a re- fairly typical day on Harla. not too much is happening yon rog and his crew are out you know chasing yon Vers. Rogan about. yeah doing doing their thing chasing vers dealing with that um we only see like a little bit of a flash of her being alerted to something is wrong and then like the roof caves in on her <laughs> and that's all we see grounding her to the events on Harla that sort of set off all of this. Yeah, the scene is literally like 30 seconds. She's in a hallway with different hair. She hears a commotion. She turns. A CGI stand-in for Captain Marvel looks in her direction. Instead of uh, destroying her atom by atom, um, throws a laser beam into a wall. Rocks fall. uh, Darben appears in the next movie. This movie. One of my favourite things in current cinema is it used to be, oh, my God, how do we show that there's a female version of Stitch? Put a pink bow on it. It's now (laughs) turned into how do we show that time has passed? Give them longer hair. That's a female. Oh, we're going back in time. Crop that hair off. Which, as a brief aside, and me, a man needing to have an opinion about women's hair, really doesn't help me because if people change their hairstyle significantly enough, I just don't recognise them. Like when we saw uh, good Captain America movie spy stuff, the second one, The Winter Soldier. You got there. Eventually. uh, In the cinema, I was sitting there going, who's this spy lady? What happened to Black Widow? What's going on? And it wasn't until about five scenes later... When ScarJo gets a you know fair few lines of dialogue, they're like, "Oh wait, she just has a different hairstyle." This is White Tail, a different <sighs> deadly spider. <laughs> I make those jokes, but for all I know, that that is an actual comic book character. Okay, sorry to continually derail this, but Black Widow gets another movie, yep. and she has a team up with Redback, who's an Australian. Black Widow spy. Oh, hell yeah. Oh, no. I just got out of the red room. (laughs) Don't know why I decided as an Australian to put on an Australian accent to say that. that. 
Uh, my question to you though is, who who plays Redback? And you can't say Margot Robbie. Margot Robbie can't be the answer for everything. Um. Oh my God! How can I forget her name? Um. She's in Lord of the Rings. She's in How to Train Your Dragon. Kate Blanchett. Yes. Yeah. Fair. All right. Wait. No. Crap. We've already had her as Hella. Oh no, but she has a different hairstyle in Thor three, so I'm not going to recognise her. So it's fine. <laughs> Isla Fisher. <laughs> Yeah. Made uh, famous yeah. because they filmed the first live action Scooby Doo in Queensland, Queensland and they wanted a local to join production. That's what I'm bringing to the team. Those facts. Fun this fact. is why I am the writer. True. And I believe you told me this or reminded me of it recently. That movie was written by James Gunn. Oh, yeah. Marvel's alumni himself. Which um, revolves around the fact that he hated Scrappy Doo. And so his whole thing with the first movie was like, I'm going to make sure he never re-enters popular culture ever again. I'm done with him. And then did several drive-bys. James Gunn, if you're listening to this and I haven't already thanked you enough for all of the great movies and TV shows and ensembles and every other thing, your absolute detestment of Scrappy-Doo brings us closer on souls on this earth. And thank you. As a young man, I was a early preteen or single digits when I saw that movie, and oh my god, that made me so happy <laughs> to see that. Well, one of the most rewarding things is also seeing that when that originally came out. So you were probably like ten ish, yeah, ten plus minus. I'm around five or six. Um, watching that again as an adult, even just for the Mary Jane joke, that's my favorite name. <laughs> It's supposed oh. to be R-rated. There's a lot of little um, hints back in there. Wow. Wouldn't have known. But so getting back to Dar Ben, yes. humanising her a little bit, because I don't think the basis of her character is uncompelling. Like she, there's a lot of good bones there because obviously it's a very nuanced thing. Yes. Captain Marvel thought she was doing the correct thing by taking down the supreme intelligence, but and we don't have a lot of the stuffing that goes in between these events. And maybe that also needed to be explored. But, you know, she takes that down. They end up in civil war. They end up with very depleted resources. We see a little bit of the actual occupants of Harla. Yeah. So when she's like, breathe, and, you know, oh, my God, we don't have to use these apparatuses oh anymore. Oh, my God, we can have masks in movies again. And we see that Harla is, you know, a bit derelict may not necessarily be the correct word, but it's run down. It's obviously had ill effects for the last 30 years where this has been going on, but we have nothing to ground us. So having something like that to sort of give Darben visual motivation for us instead of just like the yeah taking her on faith that she wants to be a good leader and letting help us the people. live in it, adding weight and gravitas to it. And I don't want to say show, don't tell, because they do show. It's just a brief flashback. But uh, getting, as you so politely reminded me, back to the point of this podcast, uh, I would start the movie, like we said, Darben clocking into work. I might even, I would even pitch her being a scientist who's like, she doesn't like fix or program the Supreme Intelligence. She's like a the computer code version of a janitor. She's like keeping stuff together. I'd probably actually research scientist around that. Yeah. And I would make the yeah. opening a straight up horror movie scene. Like even if you got to borrow some notes from Sam Raimi and Doctor Strange to Stranger Tides, um, and make it an out and out horror scene where she eventually rocks fall, everyone dies, or she gets conked out or something, and then we live in the consequences. We then, sorry, horror movie. We don't see who's destroying everything. She comes face to face with Captain Marvel, annihilate. And is, you know, scared shitless because in my version she might be a research scientist, so she probably would be in that scenario because Captain Marvel's a god tier weapon and an ultimate weapon even. Indubitably. <laughs> Universal weapon? Yes. One of those. Universal weapon. And then uh Crash the Supreme Intelligence, Deben barely makes it out alive. Um, and this is the time where you say, whoopsie doopsie, Captain Marvel caused significant collateral casualties amongst the people in the Supreme Intelligence building. So have Darbin be one of the very few left, uh, research scientist or guard, Star Force, doesn't matter. Um, I like the Star... Oh, I'm starting to regret the research scientist thing because I like them having the Star Force in common. Yeah, because they were, quote unquote, on the same team. And... A bit of the gravity to it is hinted at at least because 
So it's a major plot point in the fact of why Carol didn't go back to Earth, didn't come face to face with Monica for 30 years. Mm. Like she's ashamed of that. She literally has the Monica, the Annihilator. Um, But we don't see any of that gravity apart from, you know, her expressing regrets about it and it being Darben's motivator. So having a lot of that filling in there could definitely make her a much more compelling villain to us as viewers and just seeing how, well, yeah, you know, it makes sense, you know. She she sort of got this dual thing as she wants to restore her resources but she also wants to bring harm onto those um, involved with Captain Marvel. Um, so and a two-pronged approach. Yeah, and that would be the casualty in this version is we wouldn't have the sort of targeting aspect um but if i had to go with literally the first thing i thought of off the top of my head i would have her darben search for planets that appear uninhabited because if a surface scan of a ladner shows it's 99.36 percent water was it three six or seven six six three six three percent water then you can go well there's no way life intelligent life can possibly sustain itself there and we need water to save our species. I don't necessarily know that it's a bad thing that she goes on, you know, the sort of the grudge match and that sort of thing. Um, It's one of those things that needs to be handled with nuance, but like, you know, from her perspective, Carol was like, I'm going to help these people. From my perspective, the Marvels are evil. Yeah, so is it like, is it a six or a nine? And like, I can understand how, yeah. you know, there would be some maliciousness in that. Um, there were certainly casualties on Tarnax. We don't actually know the outcome of Aladna. Is that something that you would change? Like, do you find that a gap that you're missing? The consequences on Tarnax and showing... Or well, we see what happens with Tarnax. We see uh, Valkyrie. With Ad- yeah, Ladner. with Aladna. Definitely not at, at Atlanta. Definitely not. Um, yeah, the whole Aladna fight sequence doesn't um, doesn't really scan for me, unfortunately. Like, would you have liked to see, like, did the people make it out alive? Was there casualties? Did they just take their water? Is the atmosphere still there? Because I'm confused in the exact point of like, well, what takes an atmosphere in terms of jump point? What takes water? How can you control a jump point to take one and not the other? So, but we're presuming that from Aladdin, only the water was taken? Yeah, and since atmospheres and oceans are both fluids, I don't see how you take one without the other when you're sucking the ocean out. Densities and heights of the jump bottle, because, I mean, fluids, yes, liquids first gases, however... um, might be something there. Yeah. But so putting this all together, we get a little bit more understanding of Darben. Yes. She's a little bit more compelling to us. Um, there's a little bit more heart in it and we're like brought into the conflict a bit as viewers going, well, you can kind of understand her motivations and yeah, we can kind of see why she's got an axe to grind with Carol. Yeah. One thing to me that even as someone who was really enjoying that film, um, the fact that, you know, uh, so Monica was like, mm. well, why don't you just restart Harla's son? And Carol's just like, I just oh, never thought of yeah. that. Ma- Ooh, I'm sorry, everyone. I, I, Yeah, that's just the thing I could do. It's been 30 years. She's been in strong association with a lot of <laughs> scientists. Like, you know, when she had the Hulk sometime during the blip and she's like, oh, yeah, so, man, this Look, other thing is also happening. This is so... severely rounding down, and I don't mean to be as mean as I'm about to be here, but, uh, hey, Barry, why don't you just run faster? Hey, Carol, why don't you just restart the sun? Oh, that's a good idea. I should do that, hey. I can do that. Yeah, I mean. <laughs> and then she goes and does it. You know what restarting the sun is for Carol? Super easy. Barely an inconvenience. Please don't sue us, pitch meetings. We like you. Thanks. Um, Brian George is such a nice fellow by the seams of it. Yeah, like I would have liked the movie to turn out a little bit differently in that because, you know, it's very easy to like kill the villain and, you know, have that whole moment of, oh, you know, could we strike a compromise? Carol could restart the sun and... You know, yeah, it's a little bit having a cake and eating it too. Yeah, and so what if we approached that with genuine, what if there was another way? 
because obviously, you know, we had this with Black Panther. Some great things were brought up Mm -hmm. and, you know, we were wrong and things changed. But obviously, you know, he's killed, uh, Killmonger's killed a lot of people and we can't, you know. That that whole thing. Yeah. So, but we can do it here. So we can. my idea was that so Darben is, you know, obviously very um hesitant to sort of trust them with any of this. So my idea was you and we've very, very briefly sort of touched on this, is we have Ms. Marvel. She's operating on a different scale. She has a bit of naivete and, like, just learning about all of this. And we, so we've spoken how we'd like that touched on a little bit more with Tarnax and, like, this is a different level to what she's used to operating on. So what if you use that wide-eyed sort of wonder to be like, I have an idea, Darben. I'm going to hand you my bangle because mm-hmm. it's what they're fighting over. Give Carol a chance to restart your son without taking the Earth's son. Yeah, and I like that leans into, A, Miss Marvel's, I feel like she's got a very optimistic approach to things. Yeah. Um, and more like a we can be friends here, why fight? Like that sort of idealistic, the world doesn't need to be that way. Yeah. You know, yes, okay, we only had a certain amount of ships and things were already in progress on Tarnax. So we had to do it your way. This is a time to do it my way, you know, she could kind of say. And it proves to her mum that she was studying science. Yeah, mum, I do science. I also studied the FBI negotiators course and now we're (laughs) going to do a hostage exchange. Um, You never split the difference, that's the rule. But so you temporarily give... Star Ben both these bangles and she's like, why would you just give these to me? And you have Miss Marvel as that sort of go in between as Carol, you know, we can see how quick she flies places. So we're like, just hold here a hot minute, Da Ben. Stay chill. It's gonna be yep. Yep. Um Carol goes and does that and then, you know, Da Ben you know, willingly, hopefully, hands back the quantum bands to Kamala. Yeah, because I'm just, I like where you're going with this, and I think they should do a lot of that. Um, I'm just freewheeling off the top of my brain skull thing here. So we have two people survive the Fright Night on Halva. It's Darben. Hala. Hala, sorry. And a much more militaristic person. Um, so you sort of split Halva's character. Apologies. You sort of split Darben's character in two from what was released in the movie. And then you have one of them. So like the, the militaristic person can be more like, okay, well, we need water. Here's this water. And it also just happens to be Captain Marvel's, you know, hubby's planet. Mm. And we can go, so we can still have our cake and eat it too on that axis. Um, Cause I really want to use your Miss Marvel. We can do a different approach here. And I'm not saying they did this intentionally, but a lot of modern blockbuster movies sort of fall into the heroes protecting the status quo, the villains pointing out that things are obviously wrong. And where I think we can get to here is they brainwash people in Star Force. That's like... I don't know if it's everyone or if it's just Captain, Captain Marvel, Marvel because of her position with, you know, yeah. the experimentation. She got the powers they're trying to... Pin down on that. So I don't know if it's kind of like the Red Room where they're brainwashing Star Force en masse. That's fair. I think even if they're not like actively brain rewiring people, I think that, especially in this version, we can lean into that a little bit where the military history and the, the history of Kree that you're taught as a Star Force member really glosses over the sort of colonization and consequences of what they've done to other planets. And I want to lean into that specifically so... We have this militaristic person with Dar Ben, so we have some antagonizing force for Captain Marvel and friends to punch a bit. But you have the movie come down to an ideological fight, not a fisty fight, because Captain Marvel is someone who she's been traveling the universe for 30 odd years and she's seen a lot of stuff and she's seen what the consequences of the Kree Empire can do to other places, especially the Scrolls, Mendo, and others. But Dar Ben hasn't. And I think there's a lot of synthesis there because if we call back to the start of the movie, Darben's friends and family, they're on this planet, her people are there. She isn't directly responsible for all of the 
uh, colonization and probable genocide that goes along with that. Don't want to think about it too much. Nope. But people are dying on Halva and Hala. Hala. My, I'm sorry, everyone. Hala back, girl. <laughs> I think I make that joke in the quiz. You too. do. I stole it. <laughs> um, and that way, you can have it come down to a logical thing, and you can show that they can both learn something from each other because Darben can learn that. The Cree are bad sometimes and responsible for a lot of bad stuff. And Carol can learn that destroying the sole leader of an entire civilization might have consequences. Power vacuums, etc. So following the the ads not subtract principle of yes. dietetics and just slapping it on movies. So I think a couple of the takes could have been punched up is also your things like the the scene transitions and cuts and things like that. Um, yeah, which I assume are just because things were cut out in post, but... Yeah, I would also assume that because you have Nia DaCosta at the helm who is really quite a good director, yeah. unsurprisingly. So, you know, you have to wonder what Marvel's editors sort of did. What did they leave on the cutting room floor? Yeah, what the Marvel Creative Committee and all the people higher up in post did. Yeah, so maybe what happened there, just punching up a couple of those things, adding a little bit of the humanity grounding to Harla with Darben and also maybe changing up the resolution to that, you know, Darben having to die in, yep, giant space lasers are back. This time they're just going from the ground upwards instead of the sky downwards. Yeah. So I think those things, if you had that, where in the ratings realm do you think the movie could have landed? Depending on final execution, I think it's easily a four or a five. Yep. And I'm not just saying that because I've pitched some ideas that I would like. Um, It's probably... A podcast unto itself, but there's a lot of contention out there about how much of a movie that, how much of a Marvel movie do directors actually direct? Mm. Um, and I believe Nia DaCosta has done a lot of other excellent work, and you can see some flashes of brilliance here and some great timing and direction um, with the actors and the blocking and everything. Just freewheeling a little bit, you see uh, Sam Raimi with. Doctor Strange to Multiverse of Madness. That's the actual name, isn't it? You were going to say Electric Boogaloo, weren't you? I was desperately trying not to. Uh, you can see a lot of Sam Raimi touches in there, but I don't think that's like a whole cloth Sam Raimi movie. No, I mean, you definitely look at it go, this is a Sam Raimi product. And I think he got, I'm assuming, and this is all just guessing and speculation based on nothing, I would suggest that Sam Raimi got a fair bit more creative freedom Like, I assume they told him, like, here's the start points and here's the end points. The middle, within reason, is up to you. And I would hazard a guess that James Gunn got a similar thing with Guardians 3. They're like, fine, James, you can do whatever you want. You're going to knock this one out of the park, so just come back and do whatever. So maybe that's what we're missing a little bit because, you know, that unique sort of expression that suits the movie to a T. So, um, you know, Ryan Coogler, I think it is, for Black Panther. Yes. Um, fantastic direction in that film if everyone couldn't stop talking about that scene where the camera like flips on its head because <laughs> the dynamic has flipped on its head. But, you know, they have a reasonably good time finding really great directors. Let them do their stuff without butchering the final product. Yeah, as far as directors and actors go... Marvel's talent search department is basically second to none. Oh, yeah, their casting is still top tier to this day. Oh, it's insane. I would just like to see them let them have a bit more free reign with it. Um, I'm not going to speculate too much here because I can't remember any of the details, but I believe the director of Black Widow had some issues in that direction. Mm. And so there was some contention about, well, how much am I actually directing this movie? But I don't want to put words in their mouth. Yeah, and I think a little bit of that individuality because if we think about even Phase 2 when we were seeing the likes of Winter Soldier, that is a completely different tone. It's not necessarily quote-unquote a Marvel movie. It's a spy thriller. Absolutely. Um, And it's really fun and it handles introducing new characters with ease. It has a certain tone. It covers what it needs to for the growing universe. Yep. Um, And it's all-encompassing in that fact. 
So have Marvel got a little bit too reliant on their cookie cutter type thing and they're not trusting people with creative direction? I think it's two things. I think firstly you're right and it's the concept of the Marvel Cinematic Universe has become larger than what it actually is. And so they're trying to explore ideas like the multiverse, they're trying to set up the next Thanos and do all this stuff. It's sort of falling under the weight of itself. And secondly, the industry as a general, as an outsider with shit all to do with Hollywood, movie studios want to move away from having movie stars because movie studios can't control movie stars. They cost too much money and they become reliant on them. They want whatever actor to show up and be in their movie, that's a Warner Brothers movie, that's a Disney movie, based on whatever IP they own, that's going to bring them $1.2 billion with a B. And so a lot of the rumours coming out of the actor strike make me feel like that's the direction they want to go, especially with all the AI, such as it is, stuff that movie studios wanted to allegedly implement. Yeah, and I just don't know how they're going to be successful in that regard because I think people are naturally going to gravitate towards people. I mean, we have seen Margot Robbie and Barbie, you know, absolute phenomenon. Phenomenon? Cinnamon. Get out of my brain. (laughs) Phenomenon. Um, And then, you know, Chris Pratt was just came out of nowhere. Um, By God, that's Chris Pratt's music. Yeah, and so two very dichotomous complaints that I've heard as well is that this movie introduces too much lore they're using characters that came out of nowhere and I sort of just point straight to Guardians of the Galaxy who you know we knew nothing about them before they came on the scene and like oh my god how are they going to make this work call back to James Gunn but then we've also had people saying that oh my god you needed to watch way too much to understand this you need to have watched you know the infinity sagas important things you need to have watched captain marvel you need to have watched um wandavision and you need to have watched ms marvel do you feel like you missed much for not having watched ms marvel no and this was something i was a bit cognizant going into it a because i haven't seen ms marvel but i have seen wandavision and um captain marvel the first one but uh, Nando V Movies, popular YouTube person who I like because they have deeply reasonable takes. And on the internet, that is a phenomenon in and of itself. Wow. <laughs> um, pointed out, like he called the shot that people are going to complain about the Marvels for that reason. And before the movie even premiered, he pointed out that, no, that's not going to be a valid criticism, even though I haven't seen the movie yet, because they're going to explain exactly enough of it as you need to know for the rest of the movie. Yeah, because, I mean, so Monica and Carol have no idea what this bangle is or, you know, and, you know, Carol talks about quantum bands and her brief knowledge of them. And there's some things that you'll definitely pick up on more if uh, you know about it. So there's the whole story about uh, what you seek is seeking you. There's the nor. There's things like that, which, Mm. okay, so you maybe don't, won't pick up on that as much because you haven't seen Miss Marvel. Correct. But they're there for me. But it doesn't lose anything. And then Monica very succinctly covers how she got powers. Exactly. And that's what Marvel has a lot of faults that we could spend a dozen podcasts getting to the surface of. But you're right. And that is one of Marvel's strengths is that sort of patchwork writing. And I don't mean patchwork in a bad way here because when you're trying to do what Marvel's trying to do, you can't assume everyone's seen everything. Yeah. You just can't. Well, and that's the thing. And that's supposed to be part of what they're bringing to the table with this greater diversity is, yes, there's things that you're going to have to need to have watched to understand the multiverse saga, but there's definitely things that you can do without. And so I enjoyed Ms. Marvel. Mm-hmm. Um, there was even some things that I learnt about real life in there. Um, hadn't known about the partition before that. Um, and I really enjoy learning about history. That sort of generated me going and, you know, learning about that in real life. Yep. Um, and that's what fiction can do. Yeah. But it was fun. It's enjoyable. It's probably definitely for a younger audience. And I dare well say it would have fared better with a female audience than a male one. And that's fine. Yep. Not everybody has to be along for the ride with every Marvel property. The first season of Loki wasn't necessarily for me, maybe. I also think it was not good. 
That sounds like a different episode of this. Oh, gosh. Um, but so we're just generating different stories. I know you weren't particularly taken with Moon Knight. However, my partner, Scott, who loves mythology and history, just drank that up. <laughs> we were like, what are we going to watch? Oh, wait, there's a Marvel show that's about like... You know, there's some violence, there's, you know, there's histories, there's, you know, legends. Scott, do you want to watch an action comedy series that's heavily influenced and deeply explores mythology? Um, he just broke the yes button by slamming uh, it. And uh, you can emulate Scott by smashing that like button because we like doing this and you like listening, so hit the like button. Yeah, please like and subscribe. This was a bit of an impromptu thing to add to our sort of roster, but... To, so to sort of bring everything together, we'd, we'd like to humanise Darben a little bit, give us, the viewer, a little bit more experience with Harla, you know, get Marvel to trust the process and back off a little bit and maybe change up how things ended with the Bangles and Darben. You know, not every villain needs to be fridged. True. Uh, like in WandaVision, uh, Agatha, we're going to put you on ice until you get your own series. Okie dokie. I mean, the Kree are inevitably going to come back. The Skrulls we are assuredly going to see more of. Dar Ben can come back somewhere later. We've let that happen with other things before, like mm. the creator kind of just, uh, no, the collector, sorry. True. Kind of popped up in little bits here and there. We can let that happen. It's a big world, yeah. but it's also a very, very small world I'm sometimes. A, sure, Marvel management are reeling because of all of Jonathan Majors, which we're not going to get into. Oh, no. And the actors and writer strike throwing uh, wrenches in their plans. But you, A, need to have a general plan of where your stuff is going because a lot of the recent phase movies have felt a bit aimless. Yeah, like, and they need to at least have an internal aim because something that is self, things can be self-contained, right? They don't always need to be propelling the multiversal story forward. No. We can just enjoy a Marvel movie that's just got its own thing going on and is just in its little pocket. Yeah. And we're happy. And on that bent, superhero fatigue isn't a thing. People just don't like seeing bad movies. So you need to make good movies. And this isn't just talking to you, Marvel. This is talking to every movie studio. So... Movie studios, here's three things. Harley's going to do a three-element list again and hopefully have three elements this time. Firstly, fire every executive because you all are bad at business and you just siphon money to the top, capitalism sucks, blah, blah, blah. Trickle-down economics was the greatest lie ever sold to anyone. Secondly, um, streaming has been a mistake for everyone. Uh, the destruction of mid-budget movies means we don't get creative things anymore. We just get pre-existing IPs because you need to make a movie for $200 million, you can't do any less for some reason. So it needs to have a pre-existing IP, so it needs to have a pre-existing audience, so it have people to buy tickets and show up. How else will we get more of the 1993 Mario movie if we don't have middle-budgeted movies? And that is a great example because people respect swings more than they hate misses. Like, I love seeing weird and interesting things. I want to see good movies for certain. Like, everything, or everything everywhere all at once was a wild swing at the fences. Even if they screwed that movie up and it ended up being a three out of five, it's, it's not. not. Um, I would have really enjoyed it just for what they were trying to do. The fact that they nailed it and it's an insanely great movie is awesome. But you don't get home runs like that if you don't let people try for it. Hmm. There are so many creative people in the world, let alone Hollywood, that can make something interesting People are just going to get sick of the same things over and over again. Like the Fantastic Beasts franchise has died in the ass for multiple reasons. Oh, yep. But I'm sure there's a lot of people who liked that movie, uh, those movies, thought they could have done some interesting stuff with them and then just sort of petered out. I'm one of them. I mean, I never saw the third one. The first one was... Um I remember you having a mostly good opinion of the first one. The first one is just kind of an enjoyable romp. Yeah. Um, and the clips and I've seen of that are fun. Yeah, like there's a little bit of exposition happening. Like there is definitely lore that they're working on. Yep. Um, the oh, uh, Colin... Colin Farrell. Yeah, the guy who plays Grindelwald before the Polyjuice Potion. War off. Yeah, yeah. Was... Hilly, like he was chewing a bit of scenery. He was having fun. Yep. Um, 
Yeah. Um, and I bring you back to you. You had three points. We're on number two. What's the third? Oh, the second one was the get rid of str- – so first one was movie executives are bad executives. The bad of business should be the ones replaced with AI if anyone's going to do that. You shouldn't. The second one is streaming's bad. Firstly, because they can shelve movies and get a tax credit so they just never release the movie, which is insane that that's a thing, but unfortunately doesn't surprise me. Tears for Batgirl. And I'm starting to realise in hindsight that it's really devaluing each property. And I don't mean that in terms of like this the capitalistic worth of something. It has to cost money. I love hearing that there's, oh, there's a new blank album out and just flicking my phone and listening to it. But the fact that we don't pay money for each individual movie like and movies were uh, media was way overpriced but there needs to be a happy medium there where you make it more convenient than piracy because remember you have to compete with free but it's at the stage now where if i want to watch a movie like we were talking about the rock earlier oh emily let's go and watch the rock because it's a great movie and it has relevance to what we're talking about i have to go to a website to find out what streaming service it's on and then there's at best a 3 in 10 chance that between two of us, separate adults with our each individual lives, we have access to a streaming service that's on. Yep. Whereas I don't love this as a solution, it's just saying it off the top of my head, but if there is just one website, like the Google Play Store and the iTunes Store are mirrored perfectly for content, and whichever phone you have, it's just $2 to watch this movie from the 90s, I'm not going to think twice about that. I think there's potentially a way that you can do that through like Google Play and stuff by just purchasing the movie. Yeah. But what I'm hearing is that we all need to do a Taylor Swift and get rid of the middleman. Yes, and streaming destroys royalties, which destroys people having a job that can support themselves in a creative industry and the money just gets funneled to the top and all of these streaming services are just recombobulating and going and blah, 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 it's all a mess. And then the third one is give smaller budgets to more people and make more interesting things because your ability movie executives to figure out what the next big hit is you are better off guessing because you have no ability to tell and that's the thing i'd like them to stop trying to game the system is that like so mattel or um wb is looking at pushing out more barbie related properties let us just enjoy this one standalone thing that had great success without having to be like oh this is the next thing that we're gonna game just cool your yeah. heels a little hollywood always learns the wrong lesson so like three weeks after barbie broke some um early estimates they're like well time for the hasbro cinematic universe and that's just learning the wrong lessons get a Greta Gerwig and co managed to thread the movie, thread the needle, sorry, and make a great movie that somehow balances that it's product placement with telling an engaging emotional story. And they should be lauded for threading that needle and walking that line so finely because it's insane that she managed to do it and good on her. But we need more movies, more people take more chances, swing for the fences, because if I hear that, hey, it's not great, but there's this crazy movie, but it's really interesting there's a good chance I I give way more of a shit to go and see that than I do whatever weird franchise based on a book series is coming out next. And that's what I really hope happens for the Marvels because obviously there's been a lot of discourse about it before it's even opened <sighs> and very early. You can't log onto Facebook without it being everywhere. I really hope the word of mouth, and like I see it in the comments trying to, like there's a little bit of a mini war happening with it at the moment. It's fun. It's enjoyable. Do you regret going to see it? No, absolutely not. It was $15.50 well spent. I'm not going to complain about that. Yeah, like there was a really a lot of fun and enjoyable aspects. And even if I enjoyed the movie as a whole a lot more, um, just, you know, what they did with the Flurkins was like, <laughs> we actually laughed Do out loud. Do not run from the Flurkins. The Flurkins are here to save us. Ah, now make sure you look out for our unfair for the Marvel questions Ooh, um, because that will we'll talk about average flirk and crewmate ingestion rate, hey. which was honestly a really fun, dumb question. Speaking of letting creative people just cook and come up with something, mm. Emily's unfair questions. Oh, the dumbest crap you will have ever seen. Um, <laughs> like, yeah. to bring it back on track for a second, there are movies where. Not only have I regretted whatever money I gave to whoever for that movie, 
there have been movies I've watched where I have regretted its entire existence. And if I had one wish to undo my seeing of that movie and delete the people responsible from the world, I would seriously consider it above something obviously reasonable. Desperately want an example, please. It's, the, it's Click, the Adam Sandler movie with the remote. <laughs> I was so angry by the end of that movie. I wanted to reach, I wanted to have the remote from Click, rewind it, go into the TV, and put everyone in that movie through 17 tables each. Okay. Um, don't know if I have anything to um, compare up to that, but yeah. Look, I enjoyed the movie. Um, there were some bits that were just pretty interesting because you have things like, you know, um, Goose is just there grooming himself. Oh, Goose is great. Like um, and it just hangs on it. And uh, Samuel L. Jackson is just sort of the audience reacting to that, which honestly, who hasn't reacted to that? Like their cat grooming themselves excessively loudly like that. Um, so that was a nice I feel seen moment, but was just weirdly funny. Yeah. Um, I will always stand Kamala herself and her family. Um, all of that is pretty wonderful. Um, we get the more, as you've mentioned, the more levity, um, of, uh, Nick Fury here. Help me. Um, yeah. Um, I've just brought up my letterbox and I don't want to be one of those people who's, I have a letterbox. You have a letterbox? It's just because if I don't write down that I watched a movie and what I gave it, I just will forget that I've ever seen it. Yeah, that's fair. So I just want to go through a couple of the really badly rated things just to make some interesting comparisons here. So the worst rated things in my letterbox are Secret Invasion. It's bad. Everyone knows it's bad. I'm sorry. The people in it, you tried. I'm sure you tried. What rating did you give it? One out of five. Can you give things zero on letterbox? Uh... I did not check, but I'm committed to the X-Play rating system, one, two, three, four, or five out of five, so it's a one out of five for me, dog. Uh, no, mine is strictly zero to ten. I need more nuance. Halves don't count. That's fair. Except in hand grenades and <laughs> horseshoes. Um, Secret Invasion had a $212 million budget. How you couldn't tell from watching it. And I will forever hate that introduction, like the the (sighs) intro credits. But so, all in all, you don't regret spending the $15.50 to go and see the Marvels. Two out of five, but still enjoyable. Oh, yeah. Like, two of the other lowest rated movies I have here are Thor, Love and the Thunder and Ant-Man and the Wasp Quantumania. And I don't regret spending the money on either of those movies, but... A thousand times more likely for those movies than the Marvels. Like, there's a lot of fun stuff in the Marvels. I enjoy... And the chemistry is great. Look, uh, both of those movies I didn't necessarily mind while I was in the cinema. I tend to have a little bit of, you know, once I sleep on it, be able to to critique it a little bit Mm. better. But out of all of them for me, the Marvels was fun. It propelled things forward, um... Just like in some of the older Marvel stuff, you have the credit scene doing some really heavy lifting um, and like there are Marvel properties being teased that I'm going to be really, really excited about. Um, yeah. Did you know Ant-Man had a daughter? <laughs> um, um, and to sort of cap off my angle there, I'm just searching through, Morbius is a god-awful movie, but... It's entertain. It's bad in entertaining ways, yes. and I respect the attempt. Matt Damon dancing? No, definitely not Matt, Matt Damon. Smith. Matt Smith. Why was Matt Smith ever cast as a good guy? Having seen Morbius, having seen Last Night in Soho, another strike against Moffat is that he thinks that Matt Smith can pull off being a face. Matt Smith, you're a great actor. You should only ever play sleazy assholes. You're uh, so good at it. Well, sounds like you should probably watch House of the Dragon. I'm not going to do that, and I'm partially sorry. Uh, well, that's something. So I think that's a pretty good way to cover it. You don't regret going to see no. your money. It was a good way to spend two hours. I don't want my money back. I don't want to spend uh, the next 10 years of my life making a profitable YouTube career, finding new ways to sledge Brie Larson. Yeah, and I mean, enjoyable. I just honestly found it enjoyable. I... And you know, less well versed in the movie critique business than yourself. I watch I, too many video essays. That's my problem. I watch none. It's um, probably a better way to live. <laughs> but I <sighs> look. I enjoyed it. I myself gave it an out eight out 
eight out of ten. Yep. Um, and I'd go and see it again. And I feel like most of the people currently commenting negatively on the film when they haven't seen it really, you know, I would tell them, your booze mean nothing. I've seen what <laughs> And to the people out there who make a living sledging a great actor in Brie Larson, like she's fucking awesome. She's an Academy Award winning actor. She's Scott in Scott Pilgrim. She's great. If you make a living, if you pay your rent by finding new ways to hate on Brie Larson, when you go home from getting your groceries and you put them on the counter in the time between you putting them down and you getting your phone out to put anything on the stereo, just you don't care because obviously you're alone. You live alone. Pets don't like you. Partners leave you. Oh, my God. And this is all you have. Well, so do we want to talk about a really random comment that we got on the easy quivia? Uh, Only in generalities. I don't want to give that person like specifically – so we're not going to name them. But. So we're definitely in a growth state at the moment. Yeah. And so to have a comment on there from just someone out in the wild, I was like, well, that's kind of exciting to go see on the stats. Yep. Um, and then to actually go read what it is and no clue how this person has come across our easy quiz about Ten this. Easy question. Ten easy questions about the Marvels. Number the one. one. Sorry. I was doing the thing there. But it was just... An absolute spray at the Marvels, at females, about Hollywood not making movies that men want to see. And I was like, how did this happen? And then I closed my phone and I didn't think about it anymore because that can just stay there. Although what was the good band name from that stupid comment? Psychotic Terrorist Prostitutes. Yeah, that's like a four out of five band name. Yeah, because they it just like dropped it and was like, if I want to see something about psychotic terrorist prostitutes being <laughs> like killed and duh, 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 duh. <laughs> sorry, give me the band name again. Psychotic terrorist prostitutes. Opening for Pussy Riot. It's psychotic terrorist prostitutes. It's gonna go down well in Russia. They're going to throw. They're going to go on stage. They're gonna give you the one, two, three, four. And they're going to punk your brains out for 30 minutes. But. (sighs) I want to live in that world. I don't want to live in this person's world. I don't think anyone does. No. But so that was just a very interesting first experience as a creator, you know, waking up. The video has been up for 30 minutes, really excited. And then like that's the the comment. Um, The gulf between the excitement of having comments and that being the reality of what that comment is it's one of the things about being at the mercy of the algorithm it's like hey it's algorithm juice (laughs) um but i'm very also thankful that i'm in a place where that just does not phase me at all and to that commenter because you're not listening although actually Statistically, you might because we're talking about the Marvels. Which maybe he'll leave that comment on. again. Maybe we'll get a second great metal band name. Hopefully, that's the most that person's ever going to contribute to society. <laughs> but we don't want your algorithm juice, don't we? Not from that person. But so we don't want that algorithm juice. But the algorithm juice that we do want is you guys that have made it to the end of this podcast. You can like, you can subscribe, you can share. Tell us your opinions of the Marvels. Um, We do legitimately read every comment. Yes. Mostly scanning for cool band names that we're not going to start. Yeah. And, like, honestly, what did you think about it? Not you're going to put it off till it comes to streaming or anything like that. Did you watch it? Would you recommend it? What were your thoughts? And how can you punch up Darben as a villain? Like, what would you add to her story to be able to make this work? Yeah, like, what constructive ideas do you have in regards to this movie? Yeah, and I feel like I have dropped enough random little tidbits about budgets and different things that have happened here that we can safely call this uh, Quivia Chats and Facts. I was just going to call it Quivia Cast with two Qs. Ah, uh, look, I think everyone does that. I'm looking at you, Smoshcast. Although they changed it to Smosh Mouth now, so. 
That Somebody it, once told me Shane yells way too loud and Damien Haas is there as well. Apparently Shane from Smosh yelling too yet loud was why they had to get a new studio because it kept interrupting Good Mythical Morning, um, which is not at all relevant to this podcast and... That's for another time, folks and yeah. friends. Tommy was there wanting to be part of the cast, but Courtney was on trying not to laugh. This lyrical adaption is falling to bits. We should really just wrap up the show. Da, 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 da. That's right. We'll the quivia f- keeps coming and it won't stop coming. 30 new questions every goddamn week. We'll fix this in post. <laughs> Wait, that's my job. No, we won't. <laughs> yes, you will. Emily, anything to plug? Um, watch Quibia. Yep. Please comment. Please put any input that you can. Um, we love making it. We want more people to watch it, even if it means we have to make some sort of Riddler-esque device from the third or fourth Batman movie from the 90s to get it into people's brains, but the R&D hasn't quite come together on that yet. Yeah, look, I enjoy pulling inane questions out of properties to be able to put this together. Um, definitely any feedback we would love to hear. And tell us what you want us to cover. What What would you like me to hyper-focus on for a day and turn questions we out did, of? We did Friends Quivia, didn't we? Yes, we did Season 1. And I really stuck to the gimmick of labelling every question like the title of the episode. Which impressed me. Um, but we did Friends Quivia because we got a comment about it. So we have a 100% track record for doing Quivias based on comments of properties people have suggested. Yeah, and it's got to the point where we have a lot of properties on our docket at the moment. So we're 100% going to get to the other nine seasons. Um, <laughs> just like I'm going to get to the other six seasons of Brooklyn Nine-Nine <sighs> and the other three seasons of... The Quivia will continue Shit's until morale Creek. improves. But to it. Uh, leave a suggestion for what properties you want to see covered and there is a strong chance that we will add it to the schedule. Yeah. Um, because we like making this. We want to keep making this. Uh, but if you share it with more people, the easier it becomes for us to make more of this. Otherwise, I think Oh, thank and if you, you want um, more episodes of this inanity, please comment. Um, we don't have any plans to do this as an, as an ongoing series, but if the thought comes to us, then we'll just pick up the microphones and blah, blah, blah into them as I do every week. If we have watched a movie and we have big thoughts about it, you'll probably find us up here doing this because we were going to have this conversation anyway. anyway. Big thoughts, big feels. We're all in this together. Thanks for listening. Thanks for being a host, Emily. Thank you, Parley, for having me up here. I'm not used to being on a microphone and you will definitely hear complaints about me sounding like a gerbil. Ah, <sighs> And that's how we know it's really you and not an evil doppelganger. Thanks for listening. Bye. Subscribe.